Must literature be ethical? Must it be useful? To answer no to these questions is to push back against the entirety of the tradition, justifying the canon, the great Western works, the humanities even, in American education since the 1980s. More fundamentally, a non-ethical, non-utilitarian literature pushes against the whole of the tradition justifying the literature, literature in human life since antiquity. Plato in The Republic says that if the young guardians must be exposed to fiction, it should at least be toward moral ends. I speak to you this evening as a scholar of Arabic, Persian, Greek, and Latin. And what I have learned in the course of my doctoral work is that each of these languages possesses a literary tradition entirely unconcerned with learning, with usefulness, or with ethics. These are literatures which have been called at once by modern observers and by observers at the time, decadent. It is the coalescence of these two disapproving perspectives that has led these literatures to be essentially effaced from the historical record. Decadence comes from Latin, decadare. It's a late medieval Latin coinage. It means to fall down. But what does it mean to call a literature decadent? To answer this question, I have looked at what critics at the time in each of these four languages have to say about putative literary decline. I look at 5th century BC Athens, 2nd century CE Rome, 9th century CE Baghdad, 17th century Isfahan in modern day Iran. What becomes clear is that despite these separations in language, space, and time, critics perceive literature as declining, as breaking away from the ethical and utilitarian in much the same fashion. Something like an anatomy of decadence takes shape. This anatomy has three facets, the elevation of form over function, the spread of seemingly illogical metaphor, and the elevation of the imagination at nature's expense. The first facet in this anatomy of decadence is a literature ostensibly more concerned with how it looks and sounds than with what it means. A 10th century Arabic critic will lament the poetry of one of his contemporaries for being the product of a master of artifice, someone who's mannered in the extreme, someone who perverts language and meaning because he abuses figures of speech which manipulate sight and sound. In so doing, he breaks away from the way of the ancients, content as the ancients had been to use these figures sparingly in order to use the poem to present a limpid or transparent window onto the natural world. We can then move back in time and to the West, to a Greek critic writing under Roman rule in the second century CE, summarizing the critical consensus on the spread of what were then very fashionable technologies of discourse, this being the second sophistic. These technologies, again, are figures of speech manipulating sight and sound, reducing supposedly the otherwise beautiful works of nature to lifeless skeletons. This is part then of a broader move from text to image, from function to form, from meaning to decoration. In the extreme, the poem itself will become a kind of glorified calligraphy. In the Arabic and Persian case, these are two languages whose classical literatures are narrative in content, verse in form. Over time, this will yield to short lyric poems in the shape of birds, trees, and eggs. Objects so decorative, they could be affixed to a wall. The second facet to this anatomy of decadence is the spread of seemingly illogical, seemingly unjustifiable metaphor. A 17th century Persian poet will write, desiring the full embrace of that beautiful figure, all of the flowers have become bosoms and arms. In this line, the fantastic metamorphosis, the wild causation, the displaced affect onto nature, all of this for critics was at once unjustifiable and the hallmark of decadent description. The third and final facet to this anatomy of decadence pertains to the author, to the individual. That is, critics see a writer less concerned with how the natural world strikes his or her physical eyes than with how it strikes and can be manipulated by his or her mind's eye. This is the imagination's ascent over nature. A second century Roman historian will lament a language that is a mirror of a dissolution of morals, a mirror more fundamentally, of a language that has been reduced to a tool for human profiteering. This goes hand in hand with an imagination more and more intent on reducing the natural world to a shadow of its own desire. 
a paradox, finally. I'm asking us to study literatures that are unconcerned with learning and usefulness in order that we ourselves might learn something useful. First, our modern bias toward an ethical and utilitarian literature, a literature that will teach us about the world, how to live, how to unearth structures of oppression, together with the fact that this has been a bias more or less shared by critics across time, shouldn't blind us to the fact that in practice, much literature is not so concerned. Second conclusion, and this is why we're looking at Duchamp's path-breaking modern, modern masterpiece, The Urinal. Every facet to the anatomy of decadence, form over function, artificial syntheses of nature, inflated imagination, all of this should be familiar to us. This is the stuff of modernism. It's the stuff of aesthetics in the West and now the world over since the 19th century. Modernism then may simply be decadence by another name. Or modernism happens when aesthetic developments historically taboo become accepted. In that case, the history of decadence may in fact be the secret history of modernism. <laughs>